Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues about the connection between God and culture. And our topic today is cultural engagement and culture making. And our guest via Skype is Andy Crouch author of Culture Making, Recovering Our Creative Calling, and Andy hosted a, uh, a all-day seminar here at the seminary uh, uh, a while back, and we have uh, wanted to follow up with him because he did such a great job. So Andy, welcome. Uh, glad to have you with us. Thank you very much. So glad to be here. Wish I could be there in person. It was great <laughs> when I was there. Yeah, well, Loved we're, being there. Well, we really enjoyed having you. And then to my right here is Andy Seidel, who's the executive director of the Howard G. Hendricks uh, Center for Christian Leadership, and we're adding on in cultural engagement. There we go. And so, uh, <laughs> and I am Daryl Bach, executive director of the Center for the Cultural Engagement aspect. So you got the full team here as we awesome. discuss uh, culture <laughs> together. Andy, I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, let's talk first about a word that I think at the seminar you said is one of the most difficult words to define in the English language. What with an introduction. <laughs> like that, I'm going to give you 30 words or less. Uh, uh, um, uh, no, uh, define, define cul culture. culture. Yeah, what is culture and how should we think about it? So I borrow uh, a, a wonderful definition from culture uh, from the journalist Ken Myers, and he sums up what um, I think a lot of sociologists and anthropologists take many more words to say. Uh, Ken defines culture as what human beings make of the world in both senses. So that's quite a bit under 30 words, so let me say just a couple more words about that. Uh, culture is what we make of the world, and by that I think Ken intends us to pay attention, first of all, to the material aspect of culture. It's actually the physical production of human activity. Uh, it's not just ideas, it's not just values, it's not just um, arts or the works of imagination, it's actually embodied, you might say, in very concrete things that people make. And then it's also, uh, although it is material, it's also the other sense of that phrase, what you make of the world, which is it's the human attempt to find meaning in the world uh, and to discover, if we can, <laughs> what does this world signify? Uh, what's the significance of life in this world that seems mysterious, beautiful, wonderful, terrible, uh, but doesn't come with any explanation sort of written out or any obvious explanation just uh, naturally. So it's that combination of meaning making and material making uh, that that adds up to culture. And so when we talk about meaning making in particular, we're talking about the fact that, that we as human beings invest uh, the things around us and the combination of the way things interact around us with meaning. And, yes. and the flip side of this is, is that although uh, we make meaning for culture, culture also in very many ways shapes us as well because we, we aren't born in a vacuum. We walk into, these, in, into this meaning making that's going on around us. Is that correct? We come in th you know, thousands and thousands of years into the story of human beings making something mm -hmm. in the world. And thank goodness we don't have to uh, – sort of start from scratch because <laughs> we'd have to discover fire, <laughs> invent the wheel, um, uh, invent language. No, it, you're absolutely right. And this is a very important aspect of culture is it, it's kind of uh, reflexive and iterative nature. Uh, that is, uh, it's iterative. It, it, this process happens over and over again in one sense with every generation, but in another way, it's reflexive in that, that we make it, but then it turns around and acts on us, uh, most of all in human development. Uh, you arrive as a little baby, and the first thing you start to try to do is make sense of the world that you're in, and that world is just as much cultural as natural. And, and so you start trying to figure out what all this means, uh, including language and uh, symbolism and music and stories, uh, as well as concrete artifacts. Um, so culture acts on us, and in fact, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk later about, you know, how should Christians be transforming culture, withdrawing from culture? Uh, that's where we're going. Uh, yeah. That's where we're going. <laughs> yeah. 
it's very important to remind ourselves that culture acts on us and transforms and shapes us much more than we mm. ever shape it. Mm. Uh, I'm much more shaped by culture than I could in my wildest dreams hope to affect or shape culture. And that's the reflexive power of culture. Well, I'm going to work our way there. And the way sure. I want to work our way there is to talk about um, the fact that really, in many ways, we aren't just talking about culture as a single monolith, but culture itself is made up of many, if I can say, little cultures that are within it that also interact with each other. And I think the best way to illustrate this, and I'm going to bring in Andy here in a second on this, but when my wife and I moved to Germany for sabbatical, all the rules for marital interaction and what you could do in the society changed. Wow. Things that she could normally do here and have happen effectively, she was cut off from doing in part because she didn't know the language. So that was a little bit of a disadvantage. Yes. And, and then secondly, the culture responded to a woman doing certain things in a certain way that uh, made it a less comfortable for her to initiate that process. And so I had to step in. And our, our, our line was, we moved and all the rules changed. Uh, and uh, uh, Andy, I yeah. know, has had a lot of experience yeah. in Eastern Europe. I'm sure you found the same thing. Is that is that true? Oh, very much so. We, we lived really outside of Vienna in Austria. And they had very different rules than we did here. For example, my wife used to walk every morning, and she'd walk the same path, and she would see these two women. And it took, uh, really, she said about three or four years before they would smile, and then it was another year before they would talk to her. <laughs> okay, now I don't even want to know what kind of culture making that is, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's the point. The point is, is, that, is that what we view as culture here in, say, uh, Dallas, which is where we are, or where you're looking, I don't even, where are you sitting these days? Yeah, I'm sitting in uh, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Okay, so you're outside of Philly. We won't get into the Dallas, Philly thing in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, and and uh, th that th even within the United States, those are different yes. many cultures. And then you turn around and you change countries, and the rules change yet again. Mm -hmm. Shows how complex culture is. Correct. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I think you can make a pretty strong case that the the idea of culture as a kind of abstract noun really emerged from encounters with different cultures. You when you know the the sort of a cliche, but it's a useful cliche. Uh, as long as you are a fish swimming in one little pool, uh, you don't think of yourself as being in the water, you know? Uh, and people talk about culture that way. Um, it's, it's, it's very much in the background until you leave your home environment. Uh, and you go to some place where it's it's fellow human beings. They're you know they're Homo sapiens, image bearers, just like us. But they've made something very different of the world. Sometimes shockingly different, disturbingly different. Um, and the attempt to sort of uh, give a name to all those different patterns of making is, is what we mean when we use the word culture in the abstract. But culture never exists in the abstract. It's always the, produ the, the product of a specific history of people trying to make something of the world. And it's affected by geography. It's affected by, by history, just by the happenstance of history. So the, just the story of what happened in, in Austria or Germany is different from what happened in Texas. Uh, and that has generated, I think you used a very interesting rule, uh, interesting word, which is rules. Um, one of the things cultures do is tell us how the world, not just how it is, but how it ought to be. And they impose um, sanctions, both in the sense of positive uh, reinforcement and negative reinforcement, uh, when you either make the world the way it ought to be or violate the world the way the world ought to be. Uh, and, and this gets to a very important point about, about all cultures. Um, they're not just sort of neutral background. They really do tell us what you are allowed to do. Are you allowed to talk to a stranger? How are you allowed to talk to a stranger? What are you allowed to say to a stranger? Uh, they tell us what you can do, what you cannot do. And they really constrain human action as well as make human action possible. This is one of the things I like to emphasize because when we think culture is just about music or art or, or even ideas or values, um, we can leave the impression that it's kind of optional. I mean, you know, if you don't have to go to an art museum if you don't want to, but you are bound to and bound by culture, and it is shaping your assumptions about what it is to be human every single moment of the day. If you're a and fish, that, that water is all around you whether you want right. it to be or not. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and you need it as much as the fish needs it. Yeah. Right? 
if we could right. somehow take you out of culture, you'd be gasping. You wouldn't know who you were. You would be. You would actually be not less free than you are, even though culture also constrains your freedom. It's a very interesting kind of paradox there. Yeah. Well, uh, that, that, we, we, I'm, we don't want to turn this into a seminary class on the abstract idea of culture. So I, I, I want to <laughs> shift our attention a little bit. One of the other things you emphasize that I think people don't normally think about when they think of culture is this idea that culture isn't just ideas or values. It's also the things that we produce that that shape the way we live. And I and I, and in the book you use the example of what happened when the interstate highway system came to the United States and 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 just the change that that meant that generated all kinds of industry or it promoted some existing industries. It it put pressure on other things that did exist that had existed and made them in some ways perhaps less valuable or change where they fit. Uh, there was all this kind of cause and effect. I think in our own lifetime here lately, the the thing that shows this more than anything else may be the little thing called the iPod, uh, <laughs> which when it showed up generated all kind. It made all kinds of things possible. It also relativized, if I can use that word, a whole lot of other things that existed. Um, so that's another dimension of culture we often don't think about that is culture making as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's, this is really why I ended up titling the, the book I wrote about this, Culture Making, because it really is when we make things, <laughs> you know, the technical term for these, I suppose, is artifacts. Uh, you can also think of them, a uh, phrase I like is cultural goods. Cultural goods are the medium by which even the most intangible parts of culture are are expressed and made manifest and, and in a way kind of enforced. And when you make a new cultural good, it, it can be, it's almost always both something very specific like an iPod. And usually there's a whole system behind that. So you think about iTunes, the software behind the iPod. Um, these very concrete goods along with the systems that kind of support them. You can think about cars and interstates in the same way. It starts to move the horizons of possibility for human beings. That is to say, some things become possible that were not possible before. There was no way for me to carry around my music collection uh, with me where I, wherever I went uh, before the iPod and, and its immediate predecessors, MP, MP3 players. Uh, suddenly, I can do that. Well, that then has all these knock-on effects, which are fascinating and important to understand because they really do reshape the way they live, the way that we live. But at the same time that some things are becoming impossible, uh, so, sorry, some things are becoming possible, other things are becoming impossible. That is to say, uh, the introduction of cultural goods doesn't just expand the horizons so that more and more things become possible. It moves the horizons so that some things that were completely possible before are now all but impossible now. Uh, for example, making money as a record company <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, was very possible. In the with, 45, with, with 45, with 45 RPM. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Certain artifacts become, you know, just history. Uh, they become art artifacts in the archaeological sense, relics of another time. Mm. They had tons of meaning. You know, for a, a person of a certain age, the 45 RPM has all this significance. But to my 16-year-old son, it means nothing, right? It has no, it doesn't impinge on his life in any way. Um, and that's how culture works. It's constantly moving these horizons. And uh, the important corollary of this is if we want to see culture change, it's not enough to change ideas. Uh, and it's definitely not enough just to change hearts or attitudes. We've got to actually give people a way to act on those new ideas. And, and frankly, if you can provide a compelling enough cultural good, uh, the ideas and shape of life will follow that good rather than you having to convince them of the idea first. Sometimes the goods come before the idea. So the invention of uh, keeping time, clocks, first water clocks, then, uh, you know, tower clocks in Europe, mm. and then eventually watches. Those things were invented and then reshaped the way people thought about time, rather than people saying, you know, we need to be more timely, <laughs> so mm -hmm. let's invent a watch. It didn't work that way. It went the other way around. Well, and, and of course, sometimes when you invent something, there's, uh, and this will be the last abstract question we deal with, but sometimes when you invent something, there's what you intend to do with it, and then there are the that's, consequences that's right. that come out of it that you didn't even have in mind, but that someone else uh, who culture makes does with it, and it goes off in a direction, and it can go in any kind of direction, intended or not, uh, it, which shows how dynamic culture is and how difficult it is to, if the word is difficult, my 
my goodness, the whole phenomenon of culture is difficult because it's like it's like an untamed tiger in some ways. Absolutely. You and you really you do not. Uh, no one has the capacity to predict uh, what any significant cultural innovation will do. Uh, it's it's because too it's too public. Too many people act on it. Too many people respond in unpredictable ways. You know, one of the most remarkable um, results of the interstate highway system. Well, the, the most remarkable result was suburbia. Um, I mean, 50% of Americans, more than 50% now live in suburbs. And that really, suburbs the way we know them now did not exist before the interstate highway system. Uh, but but uh, I think you might have been able to foresee that to some extent. But who would have foreseen the rise of fast food? Uh, and fast food is also an artifact of the highway system. You would not have these dominant fast food chains uh, if we hadn't had interstate highways. I guarantee you that when Dwight Eisenhower signed the uh, National Interstate Highway and Defense Act, he was not thinking about McDonald's being you know, one of the largest <laughs> companies in the world. Um, but that's a result. And you never can foresee those kinds of uh, effects. Now, all of this means, I'm going to turn in a practical direction now, all this means that we need to be, if I can use this word, a little bit humble about how we think about culture, interact with culture, uh, our expectations about culture changing. There's a lot of Christian language today about about culture changing. You've highlighted the issue of culture making in contrast. I want you to explain why that is and and why that difference is so important to appreciate. And I think we've set the context for that by what we've yeah. said. Yeah, I know, you know, this first section has been kind of abstract, but it's important, it's foundational because <laughs> it chastens uh, our pride or hubris are, are overreaching. And I started to feel, part of why I wanted to call, uh, call this book and, and this sort of uh, line of thought, culture making, is I started to hear these just crazy verbs being thrown around. <laughs> like, we're here to impact the culture. Now, the first problem with that is that is not a verb, uh, and I, I'm going to hold the line. I refuse to let impact become a verb. But, I mean, that's a very strong word. You know, impact, you know, my mm -hmm. fist impacts your, you know, uh, cheek or whatever. Um, you, the, the chance of any person or any group of people uh, doing anything remotely like impact when you're talking about something as complex, as multifaceted, as responsive, as cumulative as, as culture is very small. Um, you know, even the verb, it's a, uh, a softer verb, but transforming culture, uh, which Richard Niebuhr used uh, in his book, Christ and Culture, his kind of punchline is rather than being against culture or being simply seeing Christ as being of culture, we should talk about Christ transforming culture. When you turn that into Christians transforming culture, let's leave aside what Christ may be doing, but what, what are we doing? I think it's way overreaching to think that we can transform culture. That is above our pay grade by many steps. And the problem is, if you set yourself up to try to have a transformative impact, uh, you are likely to mortgage yourself to whatever you think can get you there. Uh, and you will end up being you'll end up being implicated in all kinds of uh, foolishness that you shouldn't have been. Uh, and a very classic example of this is the way that the rel religious right, in its quest to transform American politics, at least for a season, became very captive to other interests within the Republican Party. Uh, and and the, they were much more transformed by entering the Republican Party than the Republican Party was transformed by them. And that tends to happen when you overreach in this way. So, so that brings us to the question then, all right, so do I just throw up my hands and walk away, or do I think about a, a different way of engaging? And I think what you did in the book that's interesting is, is that you kind of turned our attention to the possibilities of culture making in, in, in serving and engaging and thinking locally about, about mm -hmm. impact as opposed to so globally. So elaborate on that. Yeah, and what I definitely don't want people to do is just throw out their hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do. Because, first of all, uh, I do believe God is transforming cultures. I think, um, I think that's what it means to say God acts in history. Is that, uh, I mean, history is just the story of culture over time, what people have made of the world over time. And we believe that God acts in history. And God involves people in his action. So, we should not at all um, 
try to wash our hands of it or, or give up. But I think we need to ask, where is God prepared to use us? Um, and at, in one sense, the answer is God will use you wherever God will use you at whatever scale. And God does use a few people at very large scales. But for most of us, um, the overwhelming likelihood is that we will be used at a scale of culture, at a smaller scale than kind of, you know, a whole society or Western civilization or what have you, uh, because we're placed in, in much more specific locations where actually we can make a difference. We can't transform all of culture. Uh, but think about, let's, you know, really zoom down to the smallest, in some ways the fundamental unit of culture is the, the home. All of us, uh, whatever our current home life or household life is, all of us started out life and, and acquired our cultural kind of heritage from a home of some sort. And our parents or whoever were, were the sort of people who raised us had tremendous influence in, at that scale. So I can do very little to change the culture of America. But I've done a great deal, for better or for worse, to change the culture um, of the lives of two kids named Timothy and Amy, who are 16 and 13. <laughs> and uh, for them, I really shape culture. I mean, I decide when we sit down to dinner. I decide what we have for dinner. I decide what we talk about at dinner. Um, and all these are tremendously formative choices that I can make. Well, scale it up a little bit from that. All right, my home is in on a block. And on our block, uh, it's just outside the house where I'm sitting, there's about uh, about 10 houses. It's a small block. Uh, well, I have a, a lot to say about the culture of our block. When I, how often do I go outside? When I see my neighbors, how do I relate to them? Uh, do I greet them? Do I know their names? Do I know their stories? Um, do I invite them over? Uh, I have a lot of influence over the culture of this block, and not many other people, only about 10 other households, have that influence. So, when you, when you scale down from these vast you know, systems of culture to the very local places where we are, you discover that pretty much all of us can do something where we are. Andy, the, uh, a lot of times I work with a church, and churches will ask, how can I influence the culture around me? So if you take a, a particular local church that exists within the local culture, uh, how would they start to think about how can I have an influence on this culture around me? So two thoughts. The first is um, you'll do it the same way that culture has changed at every scale, and that's by by creating something primarily. Uh, I'll put a footnote on that in a moment. But you, you, culture has changed when people make more culture, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and and by that I mean very concrete things. Uh, so. You need to ask, what could we add to the culture of our community that's not there right now, that would, that would move the horizons in some way, hopefully in a beneficial way? Now, the second thing is, so you have to make something very tangible in a way. Uh, the second thing is you've got to make it in public. So think about the culture of my block, just for me as a private citizen. Uh, right now, I'm sitting in my basement. If, if all the things that I create stay in my basement... <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes as a writer, you worry that that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> but then people call you up on Skype and you think maybe it isn't all, all hopeless. Um, but uh, if, if I just stay in my basement, right, and I could create amazing things here, you know, but if I never take them out of my basement and share them with my neighbors, it's not going to change the culture of my blog. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that churches can, can one mistake that they can make is that they actually make uh, in-group culture. That is, uh, sometimes literally it happens in the church basement. <laughs> right. Uh, or in the fellowship hall or, you know, family life center or whatever. And we wait for the culture around us to come to us. And, and of course, you can invite people in, and that's a very legitimate thing to do. But if you want to change the culture of com your community, you have to make something that actually is out in public for your community. And you have to realize most people who aren't already connected with your church it, they drive by and your church is a black box to them or a beige or brown or, you know, whatever box. And they do not see anything that happens inside that box. They only see what touches their lives. So I hope that churches would start thinking about what could we create out in, in the public realm, not necessarily even our whole city, just our neighborhood, uh, that our neighbors could interact with, see, and have some sense of participation in. Because otherwise, you're not changing the culture of your neighborhood, you're just changing the culture of your church.
Good point. Yeah, I, I think that this is uh, huge because I do think that ten, churches tend – they tend to be insular. Of course, the, the tension that you have in a church is the tension between discipleship, which tends to draw you inward, mm-hmm. and uh, – and evangelism, which tends to take you outward, and I think we we wrestle in, in our churches with this relationship. Um, the churches that tend to be more inward focused and discipleship oriented are sometimes slow to step out. Another point that you make that I think is important is you talk about the importance of service in as a part of cultural engagement. And part of what our, we're talking about here is not just culture; we're talking about engaging the culture and engaging the culture in hel- helpful ways. And cultural engagement assumes <laughs> assumes engaging. I like to use the metaphor of an ambassador. An ambassador goes to a country. He represents another country by his presence, but he doesn't live in the embassy. I mean, he lives in the embassy, but he doesn't yeah. live in the embassy. Doesn't to, stay in the exactly embassy. right. He can't just park in the embassy and stay there and represent his country well. He's got to interact with the country leaders. He's got to get to know the country and the culture. He's got to really engage. And I think sometimes when we think about cultural engagement, we we do it in a way where we where we tell the culture or we dictate to the culture or something like that and we don't engage the culture. We don't interact with the culture. And it's through the interaction and particularly the service which you highlight. I'm trying to bring these two ideas together. The service that we can do in the culture that we can create at least an impression of of a of a different kind of way of of living, yes. Mm-hmm. Which itself is an artifact. Go yes. ahead. Mm-hmm. No, that's. I think that's that's very good. And and actually, let me connect it back to to what you said a moment ago because I think this is a very important point. Uh, you said, and I, I totally understand why we we all think this way. But you said, you know, well, you have evangelism, which takes us out, but then you have discipleship, and that tends to happen more inside. And I would actually say we've got to change the way we think about that. And we need to recognize that discipleship actually crucially involves the way we live outside. Absolutely. It's mission. If mission isn't a part of discipleship, you're not being a disciple. And the greatest thing that most church leaders are overlooking (laughs) right now is the discipleship realities, I might say of where their people spend most of their time, which is in the culture, in their neighborhoods, Absolutely. in their workplaces, uh, in school. You know, you, you, we have people for maybe a morning and an evening, or you know, maybe a little more than that in, in a typical week at church. And the rest of the time, they're out in the world. But what's happening out in that world? They are being challenged to um, create things. That's what work is, uh, cultivating and creating, take, taking care of what's already there and adding to it. Um, they're doing that not just in paid work, but in volunteering and participating participation in the community as well as their homes. And we have often not seen that every one of those places where people are is a, is a venue either, well, it's a venue for discipleship of some sort. <laughs> you're going to be conformed to some image. Either you're going to, to live that, live out your work, live out your, your volunteer service in your community, live out your life at home, uh, shaped by the gospel or shaped by other values and by other cultures in a way. And so we, we're neglecting this vast uh, arena for discipleship, which is where our people are spending most of their time, because we don't talk about it, and we often can't envision it, or we don't we don't have a Christian imagination for it. Um, you know, you might say that what actually happens in the church is a it's a subset of discipleship, and we may, maybe the word to use is formation. You know, that I need to be formed by the gospel through worship, through study, through prayer, through fellowship. But formation is just a small part of discipleship, and discipleship should take me out into the place where I work and the the places where I live and and spend my life, and it's there that I either bear witness to the gospel in everything I do, or I don't. So, we need to reframe it so that we think of discipleship as mostly happening out there, uh, not just happening 
in here. Now, I've got two Andys here on the other side of these mics, so it's, um, uh, so I'm going to turn to Andy Seidel here a second and, and ask him a question. You know, you were a pastor for a while, and when you listen to what Andy is saying and you hear him talk about, you know, the way in which we tend – I actually think this is a way in which culture's impacted us. We've almost secularized our lives in the mm-hmm. way our culture has taught us to secularize our lives. So there's the stuff that I do in church, and it's separate from the state over here, what right. I do in my right. life. Now, when you listen to this, Andy, and you think about the pastor, Andy Seidel, um, what what are you hearing that makes you think maybe I can I should be preaching differently, or maybe I should be communicating differently? How do I how do I help people to think holistically, if I can use that word, about the way in which their lives work and their discipleship works? What do you what do you what do you sense from our conversation uh, is the is the takeaway for a pastor who's thinking about teaching and preaching? Well, I think mainly it is to think about the people that you are preaching to. They spend most of their lives out there, outside of the church. And so the idea is, <clears throat> excuse me, to really focus on that and how they represent Jesus Christ in you know, that secular world. So the illustrations that you engage in when you teach sure. and preach have to engage the life of your community and has to challenge them. You know, I hear a lot of preaching where we talk about what happens in the home. You know yes. that we, we do right. that we do that pretty well, but then the but question: then What question, happens in the church? What happens not in the church? And then even more: What happens <laughs> in the uh, nine to five uh, time that you spend at work? Uh, your forty hours a week, which is your major. If I can say energy investment outside your family right. that you engage in, what does that look like? Do you help your people in the church? Uh, uh, imagine and envision what that life could be like connected to their walk with God. Do we do enough of that when we preach? No, we don't do nearly enough of that, and we need to do that <clears throat> because that's the primary way that we influence the world. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I would add <laughs> uh, yeah. some interesting studies have been done on on how pastors talk about the wider world. And I and Daryl, you made a very good point that the home. Actually, we talk a fair amount about uh, there's a kind of sense of responsibility right. for helping people with discipleship in the home. But uh, Scotty McLennan and Laura Nash wrote this book called Church on Sunday, Work on Monday. Hmm. Uh, and they looked at how um, pastors addressed issues of work, the nine to five work. They found that most pastors didn't mention it <laughs> for you know weeks on end. You, it's the black you, hole of right. life. You go a long time. Yes, and but see, then, most most pastors have no experience of that because they don't know that world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then when they did mention it, it was always framed negatively. Uh, especially the world of business was framed as mostly a matter of greed. And so, gosh, if you're in the business world, boy, it must be hard, you know, just with all that greed surrounding you all the time. <laughs> well. There is greed in business. Uh, there's also greed in the church, That's by right. the way. <laughs> just, just a touch. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of other things going on, and most business people, most days, are not they, they are not seeing their work primarily through the lens of greed. And you know, here's the other thing. I, I while I was writing my book, I started listening to my the sermons I was hearing in my church, and I go to a. a a fairly prosperous suburban church, a lot of people who are quite successful in their work world and influential in their work world. As Andy said, there's a lot of influence going on here. Um, and I started listening for the, the anecdotes in the sermons that, that um, where, you know, there was an illustration of faithfulness in one way or another. And I think in 18 months, I did, and this is just one church, but I did not hear a single illustration of someone who behaved in a notably faithful way where that person was not a pastor, uh, a missionary, or a volunteer in some way. Wow. And at, there was one time where uh, I, the, the illustration began by talking about this guy who was a successful small business owner and was sort of fair to his employees and his business did really well. I thought, ah, oh, I'm about to, you know, they're breaking the streak. We're about to get a really great example of a faith, <laughs> Finally, an yeah. exception. And then the punchline was he sold his business and, and went to Bolivia as a missionary. And I thought, <laughs> oh, you were so close. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is not atypical. We do not tell stories about people right. positively influencing the right. world through their activity in the world. And I think sometimes it's because 
we need to recruit volunteers for the church. <laughs> and so we make the world sound worse than it is in order to make the church sound better than it is. Oh, that's, in, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Good, you know, there are, there are a couple of ways that you can deal with this. One is to think through, you know, a lot of business uh, is about relationships and network building and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. It's not, it's not the exchange of goods that happens. It's the relationships that are built in the midst of doing that work. Yes. And we, we, need to, we need to invest that with a, with a value – and with an appreciation, uh, like we do the relationships in our homes, uh, yes. and, and and give it the same kind of attention. That's one way I think we can do it is to encourage pastors to think about how they talk about the the business uh, business life and business square where most people live. And the second thing is, you know, there are times in churches where you can have. Uh, testimonies and people talk about their lives well why not interview the people who are out there in the public right. square who are making right. the effort and who who can who know that world rather than the pastor doing it secondhand and and, and cre- again creating you're talking about creating an artifact you're creating an environment in the church that nurtures the whole of life as people are living it isn't that really what we're discussing here yeah absolutely i i will say what you'll find when you uh set out to interview people um, like that, which I think is a wonderful idea, is that most of them have never been given the vocabulary to talk about mm. what they're doing in a Christian frame. They've, they've had to just sort of make it up as they go along. So be prepared um, for folks to not be able to articulate why what they do is significant in kingdom terms, not because it isn't significant, and not because they aren't faithful in how they do it, but the church has never given them the language. Right. So, so we need to start giving people the language for why what they do um, every day, wh- whether they're you know a mom who, who works primarily in the home and in the neighborhood, or someone who runs a business, or a lawyer, or an accountant. Um, by the way, accountants are always the, the, the hard question people ask me. <laughs> they say, <laughs> how can you do accounting you know, as a Christian? Who, you know? and, and I say, look, it's about um, honesty. Uh, it's about having the virtue of being willing to say things that are hard. When you'd rather sort of shade the truth, it's about keeping people committed to the truth about how their businesses are going. This is a deeply Christian thing to do. Um, and when people don't do it faithfully, uh, people end up being lied to and, and businesses end up being destroyed. So, every field, there's a way to do it and to think about it theologically, but we haven't given them ways to do that. So, don't be alarmed if you find that people aren't very articulate at first. Um, help them discover why what they're doing matters um, in, in the work of the kingdom. Well, I think that what we've kind of articulated by doing what we've done today is to show how you can think about cultural engagement on kind of this global CNN scale, okay? (laughs) Or, Or you can think about it in a completely different way. And in thinking about it in a completely different way, there there's the opening up potential for avenues of thinking about cultural engagement in ways you've never thought about cultural engagement before. And in doing so, the possibilities then open up to create these fresh artifacts or these fresh experiences of life that are that are now uh, that are now open to what God is doing into theological engagement in a way that you weren't thinking about before. I think that's that that's where your book pushes us. Is that mm-hmm. is that a fair summary of the kind of intent of what you were after in terms of getting people to think about culture and cultural engagement? Yeah, beautifully said. And I think. Uh, our churches, the people in our churches, are waiting for someone to unfold this to them. Uh, yeah, and you know what you said is right. I mean, if you just think about culture as CNN or Fox or MSNBC or whatever, you'll get really depressed. <laughs> um, but if you think about it as the spheres where God has placed us and the scales that we have influence over, be they small or large, and that God has placed us there to, you know, the language I like is to be image bearers in those places. This is tremendously uh, good news, and people are not hearing about this from their pastors, but they could. And it, it opens up a, a lot in Scripture that we haven't touched. So, it's, uh, it's just good leadership to start addressing these things in our churches. Oh, you just used the word leadership. I mean, he's asking me to hand it over to Andy. What, what, if, what advice would you give to leaders as you, as you reflect on, on what Andy and we have been discussing? 
Well, I think one thing in terms of church leaders, pastors, is to develop relationships with the business people in their church so that they know more what's going on and so they could incorporate some of things uh, of, from the business world into their messages and talk about how this applies uh, in the home but also outside the home in the business. I think one of the things that's very interesting is that <clears throat> if we have a, a concern about reaching people, a lot of times they will listen more to a Christian business person in their own uh, realm of experience than they will to a pastor because we're we're different. Yeah, we're seen as being disconnected that's from right. life, and it's 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 an irony. The pastor is seen as being disconnected from life, even though that's the voice they right. often hear in the church. And then the pastor gets up and doesn't connect to that life that most of the people are living, and so you get a disconnect. Uh, well, th we've literally only scratch the surface <laughs> in our time together in, in thinking about this. And Andy, I appreciate uh, your spending time with us there from a distance and, and, and connecting with us by Skype, something that wouldn't have been possible 15 years ago, a good illustration <laughs> of a cultural go. artifact. And, and hopefully, maybe in the future we can talk more about this, because I know this is a passion that we all share in helping the church think through how really is the best way to engage culture and to think about it differently than the way they normally do. So thank you very, very much. Well, thanks for everything you're doing. This is a wonderful conversation. So glad to be part of it. Well, it, we're glad to have you here at the table, and we're glad you were able to join us at the table, and we look forward to inviting you back for our next video cast. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.